Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hey Coach Tony. I am your host, Tony Fiorino. You guys know by now, each week on Hey Coach Tony, we tackle the hottest topics in youth sports. And as always, we want to hear what you guys have to say. So we've already opened up the studio lines for you at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855-439-2622. I want to remind you that our good friends at Catamount Ski Area in the nearby Berkshires have agreed to give free passes to some of our best callers uh, and our best emailers. So whether you're listening in the car, at home, or even online at heycoachtony.com, Make sure to chime in on the studio lines at 855-HEY-COACH, and let's see if we can get you some free passes to Catamount before it turns into Catamount Waterslide Park, which is, uh, you got you got to really, your heart's got to bleed for these guys at the ski resorts this year. But in any event, uh, we are into March, and uh, I guess spring is basically here, at least as far as sports go. Well, listen, this week I want to take a new angle on an old topic. As parents and coaches Uh, I think it's safe to say that we're all growing more and more concerned with injuries in young athletes. I mean, back when we were kids, or at least back when I was a kid, if you got hurt, you were either told to suck it up, or if it was bad, you went straight to the doctor, uh, meaning the orthopedist. We didn't have the luxury that many high school athletes have right now. And by luxury, I mean an athletic trainer. Now, these are the men and women who are on staff at the school who take care of the athletes' injuries um, on the actual, on the front lines. Well, today we're going to take a good, hard look at the trainer and how this role has developed and evolved over the years, as well as the things that we as parents or coaches need to know about how to best utilize the trainer. So joining me in studio this morning are two of the most well-respected trainers in Connecticut. They are uh, Neil Glaviano. Neil is the head athletic trainer at Wolcott High School, uh, working for my old buddy Joe Monroe. Uh, he's also the head trainer at Advanced Physical Therapy. Also joining me is Don Bagnall, who is the head athletic trainer and medical coordinator, which I've never even heard of before. Uh, he's also the assistant athletic director at the Hopkins School in New Haven, Connecticut. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me this morning. How are you guys doing? Very good. Thanks for having us on. Uh, it's my pleasure. All right, listen, we are going to dedicate as much of the show as possible to get to all your questions, because I'm sure there are plenty of questions about youth sports injuries, things that are diagnosed, misdiagnosed, um, what does a trainer really do, all those kind of things. So whether you have questions or comments about youth sports injuries, treatment, rehab, whatever, be sure to call us in the studio at 855-HEY-COACH. That's 855-439-2622. I'm going to remind my good friend Adam, who is working the boards today, that our computer system is doo-doo, so I may need Adam to run over (laughs) on Post-it notes, a la the old Pony Express, uh, when our callers are calling in. And today's not the day for the computers to go down, because we're actually going to do a trivia contest later, and uh, you guys can win your Hey Coach Tony coffee mug, or or whatever the case may be. But, getting back to uh, the task at hand here, Um, if we can, I'd like to start off by asking you both, I guess the basic general question is how you view the actual role of the athletic trainer in high school sports, because I know there are a lot of misconceptions about who you guys are and what you really do. So, if, if you know, take a crack at it and give me a, you know, give me your feedback. What, you know, what, what's your thoughts on the role of the trainer? Well, I think it's interesting when you look and speak to some of the parents at the high school right now. They think the role is to provide water, to stretch some hamstrings, <laughs> and to tape some ankles, and that's pretty much the only qualification the athletic trainer has and the only job they do at the high school which is kind of disappointed because there's so many more things that we can do for the student athletes. Um, We do a lot of care and prevention of athletic injuries. We are the first people usually on site when an individual gets uh, injured. So we have the ability to to treat them and triage them from the second they get hurt and point them in the right direction if they need to go to the emergency room or just the doctor or if we can treat in-house. And a lot of people don't realize that we have a background in orthopedics and can do rehab for people, which is a... It's just it's sad that it's not understood sometimes. Well, that's what we're here for today. I mean, Don, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, and furthermore, <clears throat> I mean, we have um, our educational background is, you know, at least a four-year degree, and uh, we have to sit for a national exam, and furthermore, we're licensed by the state of Connecticut. So, um, you know, there's a lot, it's a lot more to it than, than taking like a, a, a two-week or, a, you know, a 90-day course, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but... Uh, 
you know, in addition, you talked about uh, my little title there as medical coordinator. Some I put that I in didn't there. Say little title. That's no. <laughs> well, I consider it a little title because okay. really an athletic trainer is what I am. But uh, a lot of times, what I, I do do is uh, coordinate the medical care and facilitate um, people that get injured that are in rehab, that need to go to specialists, uh, and if something's not working right with a particular specialist that they're seeing, that I help the parents and, more importantly, the athlete uh, troubleshoot what's going on. Well, you know, I, I, this show is really primarily about interaction between parents, coaches, and players. That's really what it's about. It's not a kid's sports show. It's a show for adults about kids' sports. Tell me a little bit about some of the interactions that you have with the parents and coaches. Because, again, the, the, there are conceptions, there are misconceptions. Tell me a little bit about, I don't know if you have any horror stories you want to share with me, but in general terms, you know, what are, what are, the, what are the guidelines, what are the, the, uh, the ground rules for interaction between the parents, the coaches, the kids, and the trainer? Well, I think in schools that have had athletic trainers before, uh, communicating with the coaches <clears throat> and the athletes is a little bit easier because they have already an established sports medicine program so they're aware of what the athletic trainer can do for them but some of the parents when they come up to the high school and they've never interacted with an athletic trainer before sometimes you know they, they can be a little tough um I, I mean i have i can give you some horror stories that just boggle your mind but um go ahead <laughs> I mean, I, I've had you don't parents, have to say names but you can <laughs> I, i've had parents call me up at six o'clock in the morning or uh, send me text messages at six o'clock in the morning asking if i'll be at the high school to take a look at their kid i've had parents argue with me if their son or daughter uh, should be going for x-rays um you know it's just it's, it's mind-blowing that they think we're trying to hold their kids out from injuries just because they're not aware of what are certification and, and qualifications are and actually our job is to take care of the kids and, and their safety is the utmost and most important thing in our minds and I think sometimes they lose track of that and think we're just holding their kids out and are going to prevent them from being able to be a, a division one or professional athlete. And so wait, so they don't, I thought when you said arguing about x-rays, I, I assume they would argue, hey my kid's hurt, he needs to get a closer look, he needs x-rays. You're saying it's the opposite? It, it can be the opposite very well. A couple of weeks ago I had a cheerleader the coach uh, had sent me an email saying, hey, can you check on this person? And I think this girl dislocated her thumb. The mom came in, and, the, you know, the interaction was great the first couple of minutes. And then when I suggested that she might need to go get x-rays and there's uh, more concern for structural damage, she became a little defensive and, and demanded to know exactly why I thought she needed to go for x-rays. And she was more concerned that she wasn't going to be able to compete in the championship meet that weekend. And she was just a, very abrasive. And once I was able to speak to her and get her to understand, the father came in and, and it started all over again. So I just think sometimes they lose track and, and perspective of it. Well, here's what cracks me up about what you just said. And it's not because of you. It's obviously because of the parent. All an x-ray is going to do is tell you if there's damage or no damage. Exactly. So that's like the idiot that says, I don't want to go to the doctor because I might find out something's wrong with me. Right. Instead of going to the doctor early and saying, okay, guess what? Playing an extra game on, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something stupid because I'm not a trainer, but let's say a slight potential stress fracture. You know, and I don't want to say that you can just rest a week and you're fine, but there's some, there are injuries that if you identify it early and you take your even three days rest, you're going to be fine. If you play one extra game, you could be talking about weeks sitting out. So you actually have parents that don't want to go get x-rays because, oh, no, no, it might be broken. <laughs> well, the x-ray doesn't make it broken. It just tells you if it is. I mean, Don, what do you think? Uh, there's another thing, uh, component to that is that, you know, just getting an x-ray really just shows what's going on with the hard, the hard tissue, the bone. Um, and someone will say, oh, well, thank God it's not broken. But, however, you know, to get to that point of an injury, they've, they've stretched some ligaments or muscles or tendons and things like that. And they might not be functional enough to, to, um, to play on that. So that, that's one component. So sometimes once the x-ray is done and it's not broken, they think it's off to the races. But in, it, in, it, in essence, it's just beginning a lot of times for that. Well, and it's kind of sad because i got to tell you, and I was going to get into this a little bit later, but we're into it now, so I'll just address my thoughts on it. The idea of even at the high school level, even at the high school varsity level, even if you're a stud at the high school varsity level, at some point you got to ask yourself, as a parent without a brain, is it worth it? I mean, if you want me to just tell you your kid can play, and then what happens if the kid goes out and has a career-ending elbow injury that requires, let's say, you know, a Tommy John surgery, or a rotator cuff tear, which if you're a pitcher is the kiss of death, or if you're a quarterback, kiss of death, or in a gymnast, 
a turned ankle that you don't support properly or rest properly turns into you know severe ligament damage. I don't think these parents get it that, and I don't want to speak on your behalf or behalf of trainers everywhere, but you're on the side of the kid, correct? I mean, you're yes. on the side of the kid first, the team second, and unfortunately, the parent last in this case. I think sometimes as an athletic trainer, um, I, I see our role as uh, we're kind of an advocate for the kid uh, to push him when he needs to be pushed, to hold him back when he needs to be uh, held back, and to try and make it all happen, uh, but not at the expense of the, the, the child's health. And uh, sometimes we need to protect them from the coaches and educate the coaches, but more importantly, I see a lot of times where you, you need to educate the parent and try and put it in perspective as, as to what how the kid is going to function and whether he's going to create further harm. And we're going to talk about some of these other issues and some of these other injuries that are a lot less obvious to recognize and diagnose, much less discern the severity of the injuries. Um, by the way, we're going to be taking your calls at 855-HEY-COACH. It's 855-439-2622. Question I have, um, my kids, you know, my oldest is a freshman in high school, and then my daughter Sophia, who's joined us in studio today, is here, uh, and I have an 11-year-old. They're all very athletic kids, so I'm, I'm very concerned about the trends in youth sports injuries and high school injuries. What are the most common injuries that you guys diagnose and treat at the high school and youth level, and, and what causes them? Well, I think one of the hot topics right now is the concern for concussions. Uh, the state passed uh, legislation two years ago uh, requiring high school coaches to take a class in concussion education and just being aware of the symptoms. They don't need to diagnose the concussion, but they just need to be aware of what the symptoms are and that the devastation that concussion can occur for someone. And um, threw me off a little bit. Of course it threw you off because someone's supposed to throw the switch on that phone and no one ever does. So the good news is the phone's just starting to light up at 855. Hey, coach. <laughs> the bad news is you just threw Neil off his track. Um, but with the concussions, now that the coaches are aware that it's a, it's a hot topic and parents are seeing it more and more in TV, I mean, kids are seeing it in video games. You can see in Madden that you can have a concussion in their, their video game that their player can be out for a couple of weeks. It, it's becoming just more obvious to people. And now the more people are aware of it, they're more concerned of it. And, you know, what once was thought as a, a bell was rung or just a ding in the head, people are bringing to our attention. So I'm seeing a lot more concussions the last couple of years more so than, than my first couple of years at, at Wilkett High School. So, What about you? I think if you look at some of the literature over the last 10 years, um, a lot of the overuse injuries that used to happen in adulthood are now happening in adolescence. You see more ACL surgeries. You may see more shoulder surgeries uh, and uh, more stress fractures from, from people just doing too much too soon. And uh, th that can be alarming. And, and concussions, you know, happens to be a, a hot topic right now. And uh, it's important. But the, the overall importance of having an athletic trainer on staff and looking out for the kids uh, for all the injuries. And, you know, sometimes it's not just sprained ankles, which we see a fair amount of the lower extremity uh, injuries. But it's, you know, the management of kids with diabetes and how they, you know, they're playing sports now. And the insulin pump has done wonderful things to enable kids to participate and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, it's in the athletic trainer's background. We try and, and, and look at everything to put that person or that child in the best position to, to compete and compete effectively. Well, and, and we're gonna, again, we're going to talk more and more about this. And you actually started talking about the various injuries. Um, we are going to be taking calls at 855. Hey, Coach, I know we got a couple of people lined up. Um, you, we're going to go to a quick break. I mean, we, we just we got we got to pay the bills here. So but, but the fact of the matter is this: when we get back, we are going to be taking uh, your calls. We are going to, in the next segment, hopefully start our uh, our little trivia show today. One of them is going to be about the uh, the most common injuries to the area of the body. Uh, we can also talk about what the most dangerous sport is, and the answers may surprise you. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony. Stick around. I'll be right back. Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio this rainy Saturday morning. Joined in studio today by Neil Glaviano and Don Bagnall, two of the most respected trainers in the state of Connecticut. And we're talking youth sports injuries and the role of the trainer. Now, I'm having a lot of fun with these guys, but I don't want to hog the mic. I know we've got some callers here. In fact, I believe calling in, uh, I think we have Amy from Oregon who is on line one. So uh, let's go to Amy. Amy, you're on Hey Coach Tony. How are you doing this morning? Good. How are you? Is this Amy from Oregon? Did I, did I hear that correctly? 
It is. Wow. Up at exactly. up at br- bright and early. Well, Amy, listen. Um, obviously, we started touching on a couple of topics. Um, curious, you know, someone who's up at six in the morning. I'm assuming you're somewhat related to this field. Uh, yeah, we have practice at nine o'clock. So I have to be in at seven today. All right. And so, um, so what, what what's your take on all this? Um, well, one thing I kind of uh, wanted to address, which you guys had had touched on briefly before, was um, concussion. Yeah. And uh, no, I've mainly had collegiate experience, but I've worked my share of youth camps uh, over the summers. And uh, one summer, I was working a youth soccer camp, and uh, we had a. Uh, an eight-year-old girl who who sustained a concussion. You know, it was a pretty obvious concussion. She was actually um, just kind of run over by uh, a 15-year-old boy who they were they were scrimmaging teams of different ages and different levels. Um, and I suggested to her father that he take her to the emergency room. You know, just to rule out any emergency situation. And his best bet, best bet would be to leave her home the next day. You know, and let her rest. Um, so we took her to the emergency room, and, you know, they, they did some imaging just as a precaution. Uh, and he comes back with her the next day uh, with a note from the doctor saying that she's, she's cleared to play. You know, she has a minor concussion, but if, uh, you know, as long as she feels, she feels good, she can go back on the field and she can play. And, you know, I had, to tell, I had to explain to the father that just because her brain imaging, the MRI or the CT scan that she had at the emergency room, came back negative, does not mean that she is totally okay. Um, I think a common misconception that a lot of parents have um, is that when <clears throat> their child goes to the emergency room with a head injury and receives imaging, if those imaging come back okay, it means they don't have a concussion or they're not injured. Um, now, concussions happen more at the cellular level, so you can't see them on CT scans and MRIs. Those are really done just to rule out any kind of potential skull fracture or any kind of hematoma, so any bleeding on the brain. So those are really done just as a precaution to rule out absolute worst-case scenario. Yeah, I mean, a, so, a concussion uh, is basically a brain bruise, right? Um, essentially, it more has to do with, um, with how the cells are firing in the brain mm-hmm. and with the different types of exchange between chemicals. And in young brains, what happens is their brains are still developing, really up until the age of about 23, actually. But... Um, with the, <laughs> the young and high school athlete, uh, it's even more crucial. Mm-hmm. And once the brain has been injured once, the brain's defense mechanism of how to respond to an injury is kind of then put on the low. So then if they're injured again, what can happen is their brain won't respond properly and they can have swelling on the brain. And that's when you get second impact syndrome, when you hear these horror stories of kids dying on the field because of improperly managed head injury. Yeah, I'm, I'll just step in with, with zero background as a physical trainer or as a doctor, uh, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. If a kid gets a concussion and you're a coach or a trainer and they come back with a doctor's note saying mild concussion, they are cleared, there is no Uh such thing. Anyone disagree with that? There is no such thing as mild concussion yesterday and you are cleared today. Anyone disagree with that? No, I think years ago they used to try to grade the level of concussions, and what they've realized is that's not the appropriate way to handle it. A concussion is a concussion no matter how severe it is. It still is damage to the brain. And and, and the old misnomer was, because I had, and I, I'm going to wait for the jokes to pour in, my brother's going to wind up calling, I had several concussions when I was a kid. And now some people will say, oh, that explains a lot. All right, I beat you to the punch. The point is, when I would get a concussion, I would just want to go, sleep and when i was a kid and you know neil is younger but me and don will get this what did they used to tell you don't let him go to sleep well guess what the message is your brain is like i need to recover from this bruise so now they're saying dark room eyes closed no music as little stimulation as possible so it's kind of the opposite so again it may explain a lot of how i am and who i am but you know is is that what's the contemporary thinking as far as recovering from a concussion don you know, you first you have first and foremost you have to look at uh, what their symptoms are. Do they have a headache? Are they dizzy? Are they nauseous? Are they uh, photophobic, which is uh, sensitive to light? Those kinds of things. But also, and this is purely subjective. Are, and the parents usually know best. Are they the same kid that they were before they got hit in the head? Um, so you have to look at that. And then you, you know, there's, there's further tests. There's impact. There's some other uh, neuropsych tests out there to kind of quantify the uh, 
the neurology of it and the knowledge base and the reaction times and things like that. So it uh, it starts out very slow, but I've had kids that have recovered in a week, and I have a soccer pra- player from the fall that uh, is still getting headaches and getting academic accommodations for that. And, and again, I mean, you're talking about the brain, which we know so little really about. I, I There's no clear-cut... Like, I'm glad Neil said it. They used to grade concussions. Now they're straying away from that because you hear mild, and like, okay, kiss it, make it better, and let's get back on the field. Hey, listen, Amy, I want to thank you for the call. Um, calling all the way in from Oregon, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you listen in and call again. Um, I don't want to spend the whole show on concussions, but that's a very, very important topic. Um, I also want to get to some more of our calls. In fact, I believe Buck is calling in that I see from Alabama on line two. Uh, Buck, you're on Hey Coach Tony. How are we doing this morning? Good. How about yourself? Alabama, did I hear that correctly? Yes, yes. I'm down here in the deep south. All right. Somebody call Mo Davenport from ESPN Radio and tell him I got the entire country listening. All right. <laughs> well, Buck, it's it's great to hear from you, uh, representing the state, the good state of Alabama. What do you have to add to all this? I mean, if it's concussions, we'll talk about it for a minute, but I'm hoping it's something else. What do you got? Well, uh, one, of the, one of the major issues that I've seen, I'm also an athletic trainer, is that uh, we've seen a huge increase in, uh, in significant uh, surgical-type injuries um, in younger players under the age of 18, not necessarily high school kids, but even youth players. Um, and maybe your panel can talk about it a little bit, but one of the things that we've seen is kids specializing in a specific sport very, very early. You know, we have 10-year-olds that are, you know, they're convinced they're the next major leaguer, and all they do is play baseball year-round. And um, we've noticed a, lo- a huge increase in ulnar collateral tears, uh, you know, kids under 16 having Tommy John surgery. Um, and I think part of the reason for this is that these young t- children are, you know, not getting a break. They're specializing in one sport, and they're playing year-round, which which can develop some significant injuries uh, before they their bodies physically develop. Um, well, so, Buck, Buck, let me ask you a question. As, a, as an athletic trainer, do you find a decent amount of injuries you treat and diagnose are, let's say, falling in that category of overuse injuries? I do. I do. Um, you know, especially at the, at, I'd say, like the, the younger high school level, like the freshmen and sophomores. Mm-hmm. Um, you see them so much more now that, uh, that they don't play any other sport. Uh, all they do is play one sport, and they play it year-round constantly. They play, you know, summer ball. They play on a travel team. They play fall ball, and then they come to play the high school season. And by that time, you know they're just uh, their bodies are deteriorated because they haven't had a break. And and by the way, you left out what's become a big business all around this country, down in the south, maybe not as much, but these indoor base. We'll talk about baseball. These indoor training facilities, which I love because if you do it in moderation, like anything else, it's always great to sharpen your skills. But for example, if you're a pitcher and you're throwing 100 pitches a week through the winter. You're just you're just asking for trouble, right? And what you see too is a lot of these these younger players, their bodies don't ever have a chance to develop. Um, you know, and part of that being that the kids don't play like they used to, so they don't ever develop uh, functional muscle strength. They do the sport specific drills, you know, year round, while not doing an overall program, and that can lead to some functional movement imbalances, and then they develop, you know. Uh, you know, an ulnar collateral tear or a, a labrum tear in a in a pitcher, which can be devastating at a young age. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And I mean, I'm going to ask my you know my friends here in the studio. When you talk about these imbalance, and these are words that you trainers use as a as a coach and a dad, I hear about imbalance, and I'm assuming that means that the the, the sport specific muscles dominate your range of movement, and the other muscles that are not compensating uh, is when you start to have some of these ligament tears like the UCL. And if anyone's wondering what UCL means, if anyone's gotten Tommy John surgery, the UCL is what has been damaged or torn. Um, But it's the same thing with, I mean, ACLs, you hear about them all the time. When I was a kid, nobody knew what the hell an ACL was. Now you got kids dropping like flies needing ACL surgery. So I'm I'm assuming when you say imbalance, Buck, you're talking about the sports-specific muscles taking over and when these athletes aren't training the rest of their muscles, that's just, again, another recipe for disaster. Guys here in the studio, what do you, is that accurate? It, it used to be that, you know, kids played a multiple, multiple sports sometimes, and, and that provided balance and moderation. And, and uh, Coach Tony's correct. Sports specialization has led to this, as I spoke before, about, you know, 
the, what used to be an adult injury, you know, getting down to the ninth grader or whatnot. Uh, more is not necessarily better. Uh, it, you need to have a, a well-balanced training program. Um, at the school I work at, Hopkins, uh, a lot of times they encourage people to do different sports. It's required. Um, so you might have a, a football player in the fall, and he might be a swimmer in the winter, and he might do weight training or something else in the spring. Uh, but that being said, there's there's that emphasis on sports specialization that somehow you're going to reach the holy grail of a college scholarship. doesn't happen a lot. Well, you say the holy grail is the college scholarship. <clears throat> We're also spoiled now that the holy grail is not no longer. The scholarship is the expected. The holy grail is the contract. And uh, <laughs> Good point. Hey, listen, people just don't know. They just don't know how, how ridiculous a thought that that is. Hey, uh, Buck, thank you so much for calling in and representing the good state of Alabama on the Hey Coach Tony Show. I hope you call in again soon. Uh, it was a very good topic, very good point to bring up, and I appreciate it. Um, all right, you know what? We're going to have to go to another break. I know we got more callers in, and we will get to you. But before we go to break, I want to remind you that we at the Hey Coach Tony Show very proud to announce that this year we're working with the Boomer Esiason Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. That's Team Boomer. And we're sponsoring a runner in the New York City Half Marathon for 2012. And I say 2012, I think it's in two weeks. Uh, and as you probably know by now, our runner is none other than Mrs. Hey Coach Tony, who has bravely stepped up and put her cute little body in jeopardy, all for the benefit of kids who are stricken with this terrible disease. Now, so far, she's raised a really big amount of money. I'm very proud of her. Uh, even more proud that several supporters and sponsors of the show have also stepped up to help us out. In return for their support, I'm going to give you guys some well-deserved recognition. Now, if you want to help us with a small donation, and I mean as little as a dollar, every dollar does help, just shoot me an email at heycoachtony at gmail.com, and uh, I'll give you the instructions for sending through your donation to Team Boomer. So far, we want to say thank you to our friends at sportssignup.com. If you need to automate your league from collections to registration and everything in between, you go to sportssignup.com. Uh, also, if you're near the Riverside section of Greenwich and you're in the mood for great Italian, I didn't say good Italian, I said great Italian, you look no further than Pomodoro Restaurant. also want to give a big thank you to the folks at the Outdoor Sports Center in Wilton, Connecticut, fulfilling all your outdoor needs for decades. And of course, wouldn't be winter without our great friends at Catamount up in the Berkshires chipping in. Um, Catamount equals winter skiing fun for the whole family. Now, again, if you want to chip in and uh, buy a decal on Mrs. Hey Coach Tony's shirt for the New York City Half Marathon, just shoot me an email at heycoachtony at gmail.com, and I'll give you more instructions about where to send your generous gift. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony. Stick around. I'll be right back. Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You are with Tony Fiorino this morning on the Hey Coach Tony Show. Joined in studio by Neil Glaviano from Wilkett High School and Don Bagnall at uh, the Hopkins School in New Haven. Two very well-respected trainers who are helping us talk about youth sports injuries. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get to some more of your calls here, but before we do, I want to throw out a little fun. So I'm going to throw some questions out, and we'll be able to answer them throughout the rest of the show. So we're going to play Coach Tony's version of the old honeymooner's favorite, the $99,000 answer. Um, Don is smiling. Neil is looking at me like, what the hell are the honeymooners? That's how old Neil is. But anyway... I got three questions here that, quite frankly, aren't all that difficult, and you don't need to be an expert to get these. So Adam's going to start fielding your calls immediately at 855 Hey Coach. First, uh, correct answer on each of these questions will have their choice of the highly coveted Hey Coach Tony coffee mug or a free lift ticket to Catamount Ski and Water Park <laughs> in the Berkshires. Um, all right, listen, 855-439-2622 is the number. Here are the questions. And I know we got you guys on hold. Just sit tight. We're going to get you in a second. First question, and if you're cheating and looking at my notes, you don't get to win anything, but we're going to let the calls do it first. First question, what is the most dangerous sport based on the number of reported injuries each year in the U.S.? Now, I got a top ten list, but let's see who gets number one. Again, you know, while we're waiting for your calls, 855-HEY-COACH, I want to let you know that according to the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which collects national patient information from each hospital for every ER visit, there are more than 10 million reported sports injuries in the U.S. every year. 10 million. We want to know which sport is the most dangerous based on the number of reported injuries. 855, hey coach. Second question. What is the most dangerous sport based on the percentage of participants in that sport who get injured? Meaning the sport where the highest percentage of players 
will get injured. 855 head coach. Third question in the $99,000 answer. It's a little tricky, and our esteemed panel of experts better get this one right, but you know, you already got coffee mugs, so you guys don't get to win anything. Question number three is, who is the composer of Swanee River? All right, Honeymooners fans everywhere are doubled over in laughter. Neil is still looking at me like I got two heads. All right, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Ed Norton. All right, I just had to say that one. Back to something serious. Third question is this. What are the most reported sports injuries in the U.S. in terms of part of the body that is injured? All right, three really cool questions. We want to get your thoughts at 855 Hey Coach. It's 855-439-2622. While we're waiting for your calls on the $99,000 answer, uh, we will get back to the phones to get some more of your thoughts. I believe we have Ron calling in. Ron is on line three, so let's go to Ron. Hey, Ron, good morning. You're on Hey Coach Tony. How are we doing? Hey, Coach Tony. Long time, first time. Oh, glad to hear that. Now, i got to tell you, Ron, the pressure is on. We heard from Oregon and we heard from Alabama. Where are you calling in from? I'm representing Unionville, Connecticut. Connecticut. Eh. All right, you know, I'll take it, but, geez, guy, i got to tell you, big letdown after hearing from Oregon and Alabama. But, hey, all kidding aside, Ron, uh, this thanks. You don't need to go national. I this do need to go national. Like I said, Mo Davenport, perk up your ears, buddy. But, Ron, what do you got for us this morning? Well, Pop Warner football is considering uh, limiting contact during practices to two hours a week. Um, I wanted to know if the panel thought that high school football programs should consider following a similar model? Great question, guys. What do you think? Two hours? I mean, maybe it's not two hours, but there is seriously right. limited contact at the youth level in Pop Warner, at least. What do you guys think? I think it's it's very difficult to try and put a number on hours sometimes. I think it depends on the philosophy of the coach, the type of players they have. Um, I know that the trend over the last few years is, is for people to hit less. Uh, but I also believe that as a football is a collision sport, you need you need that hitting to stay in shape, to stay in hitting shape, to teach the drill properly. You, you can't do drill slow speed all the time and then expect in a game for these people to block, tackle, and hit the way they should without getting hurt if they haven't practiced at full speed. Well, so, okay, we're not talking about eliminating them, just mm -hmm. maybe cutting them in half or, you know, by, by two-thirds. Um, because what I see in our league is a lot of injuries happen during practices. Um, and that was with contact, you know, maybe two-thirds of the time. Um, so it just seems to me if you limit that contact but still have enough to get the kids, you know, game ready, I just think you're going to eliminate a lot of, uh, lot of injuries. Neil, what do you think? Well, I think you're going to see a lot of injuries occurring at practice just because there are more practices usually than games or competitions or meets. Um, you know, I, I would support maybe limiting uh, the practices a little bit, but I think it's a really tough um, battle to fight. I mean, you're going to sit out there with the stopwatch and time people, oh, this group hit this many times, this group didn't, so we can allow them to continue. But I, I think if the fundamental skills aren't built – at practice, it's going to be very difficult to do it in the game setting. So I, I do think they're very important in practice. Um, and, and I think if you did limit them, um, you would see a decrease in injuries. You wouldn't prevent all the injuries, but you, you might see a, a decrease in, especially as people go through a longer practice and their bodies start to fatigue and break down. They start getting tired and start not doing the things they're supposed to be doing. So yeah, fundamentals start to break down. Ron, are you? Let me ask you a question. Are you, for lack of a better term, a football guy? Um, I've been on the board for our program, the Farmington Valley Mudhogs. Go Mudhogs. Go Mudhogs. Um, we have players from uh, Farmington, Avon, Burlington, um, some from Canton, Bristol. So we have a huge league. We have over 300 kids. That is big so, league. So, yeah, I've been, I've been on the board for about 15 years now. All right, so as a football guy, let me run this past you. Instead of just, let's take this away from the science and, and the mathematics for a second because I do think, especially at the youth levels, um, and I've heard a lot about limiting contact. A lot of it comes down to the type of contact. In other words, football guys know what a hamburger drill is. It's hitting for the sake of hitting. You line kids up. You knock them around. And, you know, the toughest guy wins. What you were seeing a lot more of now, especially at the youth level, is a lot of the hit, wrap, but don't take down. And it allows kids to get 
to force them to be more fundamentally sound and, and still take away a lot of that risk of injury. Is, is, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because at the high school level, i got to tell you, I think there is less contact. Um, in my hometown, Tony DiMatteo is uh, an absolute legend, and he doesn't have anywhere near as much contact in practice as you would think. But his kids are all, always fundamentally sound, and they're always contenders. So what do you think about maybe not so much limiting the contact but altering the type of contact that occurs? Right, yeah, I agree with that. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done that. We've taken away certain drills. Um, you know, you talk about the hamburger drills. We've taken those out, and we've taken, um, I, I forget how many yards it is exactly, but we don't let the kids run straight out at each other during practices and just, you know, um, we've limited the number of yards between a player where they can hit. So, we, you know, we've done some of that. Um, but I just feel that if we have less contact, and your guys are right, the panel's right, it would be impossible to have someone stand there. You know, one team is going to get an advantage over another team because they're going to stretch the rules, and it, it would be really hard to monitor, especially <clears throat> at the upper levels, high school and, and so forth. But well, I just thought it was in- interesting that Pop Warner was, was considering that. Well, I think it's great that they're considering it. You guys got anything to add to it? I think you have to look at coaching education and how you're educating your youth sports. Uh, my wife was a uh, youth sport coach, and uh, she was a, a varsity athlete, but uh, she did a good job. And So you're asking a lot of these youth coaches, but I think with a sport like football, the more clinics they can tend uh, can attend and and the more education they have about proper tackling techniques and how to run drills but also how you know looking at at least a, a, an exposure to injuries and and so that they can kind of judge whether a drill is going to be um, safe or potentially dangerous right are there any dangerous are there any drills that you would remove today from from practices well uh, I believe bull in the ring uh, is now outlawed. I do. I think they actually yep. outlawed it. So people have tried to change the name of it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, bull in the ring basically is one kid at football practice is in the middle of a big circle of other guys. You call a random number, and if that guy happens to be behind you, you better look the hell out. <laughs> uh, so that one's been eliminated. Uh, I think bringing in the uh, the yardage restrictions on drills like the you know, the Oklahoma the Okies. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily eliminate drills as much as you know what, what Don was saying the education of the coaches I mean just hate to say it and at the high school level you can say this at the youth level it's harder but coaches just use your head you I mean use your brain if, if, if something looks like it's a violent drill then guess what then it's a violent drill and someone can and probably will get hurt all right listen Ron great call I hope you call in again man first time caller I hope uh, you continue to listen to the show and spread the word we're going to have to go Definitely. to a quick break. Let's go national. I'm going national, man. You, you and me <laughs> both, brother. Don't worry about it. All right, listen. We're going to have to go to a quick break, but before we do, I want to remind you of the questions. And I guess when we get back, if anyone's too chicken to answer, I'm going to let our panel get at it. First is, what is the most dangerous sport based on the number of reported injuries per year? Second question, what's the most dangerous sport based on the percentage of players who report injuries? And third question is, what, um, da, 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 how did I say this? I'm an idiot. All right. What what part of the body gets most injured in youth sports? 855-HEY-COACH. It's 855-439-2622. We will take whatever calls we can when we get back. Uh, if you're chicken out, then you lose your shot at the coveted Hey Coach Tony coffee mug. And I'll give another one to, uh, to either Neil, <laughs> Neil or Don here. You're listening to Hey Coach Tony. Stick around. I'll be right back. Coach Tony. Hey, welcome back, everybody. You are with Hey Coach Tony on ESPN Radio, soon to be on CPTV Sports throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, I think May, June is the target we've got now. All right, listen, before we get back to your calls, um, looks like people are chickening out. So we're going to we're gonna throw this one over first to my beautiful daughter, Sophia, who's going to get her chance to answer this first question, and then we'll go to our panel. Sophia, what is the most dangerous sport based on the number of reported injuries in the U.S.? Lacrosse. Lacrosse. A very big contact sport. Sophia's favorite sport. Matter of fact, we're going to a lacrosse game after the show. Eh, wrong. It is not lacrosse. It is not lacrosse. Sorry, Sophia, you win nothing. Neil, I see you trying to Google on the other computer guy. You're not allowed to cheat. Hey, you won't give me the password on the computer. So yeah, I give I no password you. for you, guy. No soup for you. What is the most dangerous sport in the U.S. based on number of reported injuries? I'd say ice hockey. Ice hockey. 
Another very fast moving, very high impact sport. <clears throat> Not right. Very wrong. Very, very wrong. Adam thinks he knows the answer. Right, let, me get, let me go to Don first, Adam, then you can take a crack at it. Don, number one sport for reported injuries in the U.S. No pressure, Don. Football. Football, which is the one everybody thinks is right, and it's not. It is wrong. All right, Adam. Yep, all right. I'm going cheerleading. Leave it to Adam to bring the show to a grinding halt. No, it's not cheerleading. <laughs> ah. no, by the way, it is one of the quickest growing sports, and if there was a fourth question, that would probably be right, Adam. So I will give you right, we'll best see. guess. Now, listen, Thank I, know you. You, I know you stole my Hey Coach Tony coffee mug from the studio, but I will tell you, for that guess... You can have a legitimate one if you bring the other one back. All right. So here's the, here's the quick top ten list. Number one sport with 2.56 million reported injuries each year, basketball. No one would have guessed that. Sophia looks like somebody farted. That's a look on her face. Number two, cycling, 2.5 million. Football, number three with 2.38 million. Do I get a half a mug? No, you don't. Actually, you got a mug already. You, I tell you what, you can take my Dunkin' Donuts cup home with you. All right. Softball is four with one million injuries. Baseball, fifth with 763,000. Uh, Skateboarding, which isn't a sport. Sorry, it's not, but it's on number six. Horseback riding is number seven. Golf is number eight. Ice hockey behind golf. Believe that. And lacrosse barely squeaked into the top ten. All right. We're going to do another one. What is the most dangerous sport based on the percentage of players in that sport that report an injury? Sophia, do you want to go first again and just say lacrosse? Yeah. All right, wrong. I'm just going to cut right to that one. Lacrosse, wrong. Um, Don, you get to go second this time. So you're talking a great, greater number of The greatest people. percentage of players on, you know, participating in that sport who report injuries. For more exposures, et cetera, et cetera? Correct. Okay. Um, I'll go with soccer. Soccer is very wrong. Didn't even make the top ten. You believe that? I better find another vocation. No, no, you guys are good at solving the injuries. Just listen, you, you, when it comes to fixing ankles and taping ankles and icing, that's what you guys do best. That was so insulting. All right, Neil, what do you got? I'll say wrestling. Wrestling, great answer. Not right, though. Not correct. Adam, you're going to take a crack at this one yeah, and don't I'll, say cheerleading? I'll say, I'll say football. Yes! All right, Adam, way yeah. to go, buddy. Woo! All right. <laughs> football, 4.85% of the athletes who play football will report an injury each year. Um... Again, skateboarding is second, but skateboarding, you know, you, that's it's not a sport, and I'm surprised the number isn't higher. But it goes from football at 4.8% down to skateboarding at 1.8%. Basketball is next. Baseball is fourth. Cycling is fifth. Softball, six. Ice hockey, seven. Volleyball, eight. Golf, nine. And tennis is ten. Lacrosse did not even crack the top ten there, Sophia, so I hope you're, not, hope you're uh, proud of your sport. All right. We got, we, got, we got some time. All right. We are going to go to the third question, <clears throat> which is, and I am going to give Sophia a chance to redeem herself. Um, Sophia, of all the reported injuries in the U.S. in sports, what part of the body is injured the most? Um, Very few parts of your body, Sophia. Let's go, I baby. I don't know. Head? Sophia, way to go! She actually nailed it. With all the concussion talk, guys, the head is the number one most injured part of the body. You have a coffee mug at home. You get nothing. Um, you get a ride to lacrosse. Has that? Yeah, head. There are 275,000 reported head injuries in youth sports each year. That is ridiculous. Um, I, I guess we can roll down the line a little bit. What do you think is second, Neil? I'd say either knee or ankle, if I can get two guesses. Uh, you know, that's, wait, head, that's hedging your bet. That is so hedging the bet. I tell you what. Now, just to, I will give you a hint, Don. One of those is correct. If you can pick which of those is correct, you guys will split an extra coffee mug. I'll be honest with you there. I was going to go with knee. And you should have gone with ankle. Wow, Neil just pulls ahead. Pulls ahead. <laughs> Joe Monroe from Woolcott is just beaming with pride right now. It was indeed ankle. Um, number three is the one I would have guessed is number one. And it's, it's, it is indeed a part of the body, but it's not one you would think of. So who wants to take a credit? Adam, what do you think is number three? All right, so it's not knee. No, it's not knee. Okay, um, <laughs> Everyone's hedging. Don is the only guy playing by the rules uh, here. Pff, man. Uh, tsh, uh, man. I'm going to say 
Your shoulder. <laughs> shoulder is not a bad guess. All right. I gave you guys a hint. It's a part of the body, but it's not really. All right, I'll give it uh, to you. Because I, I, cause I injured these throughout my career. I broke them all the time. Fingers. Uh, Fingers is number three. I was going to say hand. I, so much for Don being the guy playing by the rules. Way to hedge again. I tell you what. If I ever got a, if I got to start a poker game, I'm going to call the Athletic Trainers Conference of Connecticut, and I'm just going to host it, and I'm going to clean up. <laughs> all right. So finger was number three. Number four, face. Surprisingly enough, face was number four. Knee came, uh, came in at number five. Shoulders, number six. Wrist is number seven. Lower abdomen was number eight, which I found really odd. Um, lower arm was nine. Lower leg was ten. Uh, that was kind of fun. All you callers just wussed out. Nobody decided to call in on this one. Well, listen, I more coffee mugs for me. That's it. Um, <clears throat> all right, you know what? Before we get out of here, there's a story I got I got sent to me, which is just sad. You know, the, the, here's the thing. Sad, sad, sad examples of stuff that's been done by parents. Uh, I think it hit an all-new low. We, we got, where's the story here? Oh, yeah, here we go. Leave it to Boston, folks. Leave it to Boston and leave it to youth hockey to send us a story that's just going to make you sick. I'm going to try to get through this quickly. <clears throat> Spokesperson for the governing body of high school sports in Massachusetts says that a girls' tournament hockey game is not going to be replayed, even though a parent of a player on one team aimed an illegal green laser pointer into the eyes of the opposing goalie during the third period in a one nothing game. <clears throat> Winthrop, Massachusetts, apparently beat... Medway Ashland three to one on Wednesday, but when the score was one nothing at the start of the third period, score was I'm sorry. Then they did tie it up without the illegal activity. Score was tied. Father of a Winthrop player put the uh, put the laser pointer in the eyes of the Ashland goalie. Now what most people don't know, we've all seen red laser pointers. The green ones are illegal. You know why? They can blind you. They can literally blind you. The goalie is still um, complaining about headaches, and it, it, this one just it, it made me sick. Um, but you know what, reading this one made me think back, and i got a couple of minutes. There are a couple of other truly ridiculous things that have happened where parents have done horrible things to embarrass themselves and their kids, and it wouldn't be a good show without me getting through these. So I'll go through them quickly. A mother, angered by her son being called for fouls in a high school basketball game, ran to the ref's locker room after the game and took a swing at the referee. Way to go, Mom. Another mom, upset with a referee's call in a soccer game of 12-year-olds, did not wait for after the game ran onto the field, and punched the referee in the face. Now, this referee, by the way, was a volunteer 13-year-old kid. Now, at, by this point, I would hope we have all heard about the infamous hockey dad from Massachusetts. This guy took exception to how another dad was running the practice. So what did he do? He beat the other dad to death in front of the kids. Now, how about the dad in Texas? So outraged that his son lost the quarterback position to the coach's son, after being banned from functions for his, uh, his existing outrageous behavior, went to the field house with an AK-47 and murdered the football coach. Now, these are all examples of horrible behavior. Let's take a quick look at some of the more creative ones, because I think i got enough time for this. This ain't just about mainstream sports. If any of you guys ever heard of a movie called The Texas Cheerleader Murdering Mom, it's based on a true story of a mom who hired a hitman to murder the girl who took her daughter's spot on the cheerleading squad. That's very creative. <laughs> Here's another creative one. A dad trying to give his son an edge, no pun intended, put razor blades onto his son's football helmet. And he cut grooves and put razor blades in his son's helmet so that anyone who would try to tackle him would get cut up. You know how he got caught? The other team was basically bleeding to death during the game. So that's how he got caught. And last but not least, this is my favorite. I hate to say favorite. There was a tennis dad in Europe who was brought up on charges because he would sneak poison into the water bottles of his son's opponent to make them sick enough so his son would win. You want to know how he got caught? In a championship match, dad didn't want to take any chances, so he overdosed. Kid got so sick he had to retire the match. While driving home from the match, the kid basically drove off the side of the road and killed himself in a car accident. You think I wasn't going to end on a down note, folks? It wouldn't be a Saturday without some feel-good stuff from Coach Tony. Listen, great calls today. I want to thank our panel of experts here. Drink well with your coffee mugs. We'll see you next week, guys.